So of course, this is the primary weapon platform on board. It's the coolest thing that people see <laughs> when they come aboard. Uh, and this is again, that technology from about 1955 onwards. And so the modifications on this are massive, right? From the Cleveland class to the Galveston class cruiser. Uh, so in total, there were six Clevelands that were taken uh, and converted with guided missiles. Three were given the Talos missile system like you see here. Three were given uh, the Terrier system, which was a smaller mid-range system. Now, why are they doing that? Well, because we're not using propelled, propelled planes anymore, right, that are going 150, 200 miles an hour. Now we're dealing with jets and bombers that are at 100,000 feet in the air and jets that are going 650 miles an hour. So none of the weapons on the Sullivans would have ever done any damage. So we needed something that could reach the speeds uh, and the distance. And so the 3T program was developed, the Tartar, Terrier, and Talos system uh, with Johns Hopkins University in their propulsion lab and the US Navy, and they developed these. Now the Talos was the largest of these uh, weapons and missiles. Uh, in total, it's about 32 feet long. It is a booster missile system. So like a space shuttle, it would launch, the booster would expel all of its propellant and decouple, fall into the ocean. And then the ramjet engine, which is an air powered engine, would then take over and it would be able to travel up to about 130 miles at going about 1900 miles an hour. Within the system itself, they were able to con carry conventional warheads, which is actually what you see here. Now these are bluebirds, right? These are trainers, right? They're not the actual Talos missiles, uh, but you'll see that little cone coming out of the nose. Mm -hmm. That was the warhead. So they had conventional warheads and we also carried low yield uh, nuclear warheads on board as well. Um, this was originally a, a primary uh, anti-air weapon, but eventually, as with all Navy and military, they get modified over the life of uh, over its career. And so they developed eight different models of the Talos. And uh, by the end, they were able to do surface uh, anti-radiation, meaning take out radar stations, and then also uh, air as well. So was this Talo system kind of the first of its kind after World War II? Was this some of the early versions of these types of missile systems or where did that sort of fall in the evolution of that? It was, they were the first real successful guidance uh, missile systems. Um, there was, I mean, that's an unbelievable time period for technology, you know, certainly arms races against the Soviet Union uh, so the V-2 is being developed during World War II, right? The mm -hmm. Germans are developing the V-2. So the Soviet Union kind of goes in, takes some scientists. We come in, we take some scientists. And so now it's a, a race, for lack of a better term. It's a race. Not only that, you're developing the nuclear programs, the A-bomb and the H-bomb. Uh, and are these deterrent weapons? Are they attack weapons? Um, is it show of force weaponry? Throughout her whole life, her, for, this, for the USS Little Rock, her job was much more subtle. And as we go through, we'll talk about some of that. Uh, she never fired a weapon in anger uh, in World War II or the Cold War. Uh, and that shows the success of her platform. She didn't need to fire mm -hmm. any weapons. A couple of her sister ships did go to Vietnam and they did fire the Talos against the MiGs or anti-radiation radar stations. Uh, but the Little Rock spent most of her time from 60 to 76 uh, in the second fleet, the Atlantic fleet, and then the Mediterranean fleet, which is um, where most of her subtle show of force deterrent work uh, occurs. So what we see here is the actual missile itself with the wings and the fins. How many of these missiles would the ship have carried typically? Great question. So for vessels that were in Vietnam, like I just mentioned, they would carry, talking to those crews, they would carry 45 uh, to 50. We usually carried about 35. 
And one of the areas that we're going to go see now is how they stowed them. All right, and this is the, the basics of this program is that it was an all horizontal system, all right? Nowadays, vertical launching, the hatch opens up on the deck, they come straight out and away they go. Mm -hmm. We did not have that technology at that time. We could not begin to fire the booster in the interior of the vessel uh, at that time. It would just blow up the whole ship. <laughs> so that was not really developed until the mid 70s. And so obsolescence really occurs uh, in the mid 70s. This ship is taken out in 76, as I've mentioned. Her sister ships, the last one goes out in 79. Then you have the Ticonderoga cruiser class being developed in the very early 80s and the plans even bleeding into the 70s. And then they have the whole ASROC vertical launching system standard missile uh, system that kind of replaced this system here. But all of this stuff that you see behind you, from the big black dish all the way down through the big drums and that uh, satellite dish, what looks like a satellite dish, was to guide the missile to its target using analog technology. All right, the computers were not computers, they were consoles. They could do one calculation and then you had to forward it on to another console that did another calculation. And so that's why you see all of this real estate up and down through the vessel, uh, making it uh, very archaic by today's standards, but very state of the art back then. Yeah. So we're gonna head to the missile house. And again, as an all horizontal system, the missile had to be lying down the whole time while you're assembling it, while you're putting on the wings and fins. And so that's why all of the space needed to be dedicated to it. So when these were fired, what could, did they have to be rotated at all? Could you fire it in this sort of configuration or what was the, the approach there? Very good question. Uh, so you see the doors there, right? That's the last stage. They come through right out onto the launcher and then the launcher would be able to rotate you know, the 170 degrees, let's say. They certainly wouldn't want to face them that way. Mm -hmm. But now you have the two big domes are the tracking radars, all right? Those are the SPG-49s. The SPG-49s would lock onto a target, all right? And then that's what would communicate with the guidance system. The, the missile would launch, there's a laser beam. It would take about 150, 200 feet for the missile to connect with the laser beam and to, to, um, to read it. And then it would align itself. And now the laser is following the target. And so therefore the missile is following the laser. Mm -hmm. So you're tracking a target, but really the missile is just reading where the laser is. And it just so happens to end at a target, <laughs> right? It's not actually tracking the target. Right. It's following the laser that's tracking the target. So that's, this would rotate, and this is actually uh, the turret 64, right? So in Cleveland class, this was the last six inch gun mount. There was another six inch gun mount behind it. And then the superstructure, which was way forward from here, the superstructure was much, much smaller as a Cleveland class than what you'd see today on a photo or as we walk through. So they just removed uh, turret 63 for the six inch 47, right? And put on, onto the barbette and then put the launcher, the Mark VII launcher on it. Now this was a spit and polish ship, right? This was also a flagship of the sixth fleet and the second fleet, which meant that the vice admiral, when he was command and control of the particular fleet, this is where he lived. So when they would, just like anything else, when they would fire off a missile for training or practice, there would be the deck guys, the deck apes with their paint, because this would all burn off, all right, <laughs> from, the, from the blast of the propellant. And so the guys were there ready to paint it up and uh, make sure she's a spit and, sp spit and polish ship again. So what we'll do is uh, we'll, there, this missile house is broken into three components. Uh, just the way the tour route is, you're actually in the last component now, which is the wing and fin space. 
So unlike a vertical launching system where the missile comes out of the deck and the wings just and the fins just unfold, here they had to be manually put on. So you can see uh, the you can see the wings and the fins in the stowage racks there. Uh, I also secured a bunch of those from the museum in South Bend, Indiana. He had about 20 of them. Uh, and so there'd be guys standing on this platform here. The missile, as you can see, you know, is on the launcher rail above them, right? It would come from this space, and then they would manually lock in the wings and the fins. Yeah, it's such an interesting, like you said, time with technology. I mean, you've obviously got some big advancements here, but then thinking about like manually adding those fins oh, yeah. And, yeah. and that element of it and how, yeah, how much labor was still involved. Yes, there were so many guys dedicated to uh, fire control on board the Little Rock. Now you might need, you know, if you're doing a 24 hour shift, of course, right? You might need 20, 25. Here they had 300, 400. Mm -hmm. So this is the transfer rail here, right? This is attached to a power cart. And this is how this, the, the Talos were actually manually moved from space to space. Now, again, as I mentioned, we're in the last space. This missile house is broken into three different sections. So this was the last one, the wing and fin, which led right out to the launcher. They would have to test the missiles and the electronics once a month. So they would have to bring it all the way forward with the power cart. Right above there, you can actually see the ladder mounts. The ladder is gone, the black right there, led into the uh, testing area. So they would plug in, make sure all the electronics are still working, and then send it all the way back to the stowage area. Uh, and they had to do that for every missile every month. The, for the ships that did use these kind of during the Vietnam War and in those conflicts, how, how effective were the Talos missiles, missiles yes. typically considered? Uh, I believe that they were very successful. All right, the Oklahoma City and the Galveston fired them against, um, against uh, MiGs and, again, the anti-radiation, the radar stations to try and take out uh, radar stations of the enemy. Uh, they were, I, think, uh, I think the Oklahoma City shot down four MiGs with them, so good successful rate. When they were first constructed, it was one plane per one missile. That's not very efficient in terms of loading, as you can see what it would have to go through just to be put onto the launcher. So that's why then they added the low yield nuclear weapon, which would be able to detonate and potentially take out a whole squadron of planes with one missile, mm -hmm. right? So this is now an actual Talos missile, demilled of course, uh, but so it's not the blue, the bluebirds like you see out there. But this was the assembly. So this is where they would take the booster and they would mate it with the missile. Now again, kind of wonky, they had an overhead crane, right? With the guys stationed right here. So once the missile and the booster was mated, he would come pick it up with the crane and he would bring it into the, uh, assemb the trays here, the assembly trays. This would have to be manually rotated up to the launcher rail. So, and it's not, it's not a curve, it's not a circle. You'd think that they would just build something that was a big circle, no, <laughs> right? They would put it, say, into this assembly tray. This would raise up. This assembly tray would have to be slid over. Then this one goes down. Then the top one with the missile slides over. So it's a big square. And then you do it again, and then it would connect with the boots and the shoes to the launcher go into the missile house at 12 feet a second, then out to the launcher. Wow, yeah, the logistics of that. Yeah, really, completely. Well, what, so what was the, the fire rate, do you know, like if they'd actively been trying to fire these off? So if they're at general quarters, you would have two on the launcher, two ready to go in the, in the wing and fin space. Then you can have four on each side ready to go to the launcher rail. So that was a very quick thing. You were able to track up to six targets per, uh, per side. Mm -hmm. So the starboard side and the port side, they would each be able to be tracking six targets. But they had to then be consecutively fired. It couldn't just be one fire, all six targets. They track one, if you hit it, now track two comes up, then you hit it, then track three comes up. So it's 
you know, one after the other yes. as opposed to all at once. So they would have three to four sitting here ready to go into the wing and fin. That would probably be about a 45 second interval uh, to get the, the communications with between the tracking and the guidance system using a large computer that's, you know, <laughs> the size of this room, not really, but, you know, a really large early computer to compute uh, and bringing the guidance and the tracking system together. Um, if you did not have a missile at all, this whole process that I'm showing you now would be about a nine to 11 minute process, which is an eternity in right. wartime. So they would have some at the ready and certainly for those uh, L, uh, CLGs uh, in Vietnam, they would uh, have them all stowed ready to go. So Joshua, now we are in what I like to call the Amazon Fulfillment Center, <laughs> right? And that's, it always gets a laugh, I like that. This was the stowage for the missiles themselves. So as I said, we're, the tour route is in a backwards formation. So this was the first stage. So you'll see, and this is mimicked on both sides. It's just harder to see over there. But you'll see here in the corner on the overhead, all the teeth, mm -hmm. all right, and all the gearing. That was uh, the strike down hatch. So the missiles would be loaded on top of the missile house because it's a big empty open space up there. Then the strike down hatches would open. There's an elevator right here, right? And you can see some of the, the chain and the gearing for that. That would raise up. Then not only did we have a two, one overhead crane, we had two overhead cranes. And so you'll see the large crane over there, which would go the whole beam of the space. It would come pick it up and then put it in its stowage area here. And they did them separately. They weren't mated together. They just didn't trust the technology of sure. keeping them together. So you would have, you could have four to five missiles and boosters stacked up in this space. And then if you had overflow, you can keep them in the assembly trays that we just saw. And you said they were mated together up in that section? Correct. Okay. So the overhead crane would pick one up, put it in the transfer rail, bring the booster, put it in the transfer rail. The power cart would be manually moved forward and then mated and then, and then into the launcher, then into the wing and fin, and then out to the launcher, rail, the launcher itself. Mm -hmm. So this was not a lot of guys who served aboard unless you were... Uh, in the fire control division uh, would have been in this space, right? This was a space that was uh, guarded by Marines and there's a lot of those spaces on board the Little Rock uh, that were classified or for certain eyes only. And so this would have been one of those spaces that would have been uh, secured at all times. And so we'll get an old salt who's, who comes aboard, who served aboard four years, said, well, I've never been in here before. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in the four years that I was on board, they never were here. Uh, certainly other spaces, well, command and control, you know, if there's a, you got a engine man or something, you know, they would never go up to the admiral's quarters or something, mm -hmm. right? So they enjoy that access of things that they could not see when they were here 24-7. Yeah, even they're, they're, they're already confined to the ship itself, and then even within that, there are these yes. spaces that they might not have ever seen. Correct. They go to their duty station, they go to lunch, dinner, and breakfast, and they go to their berthing and probably the cruise lounge, barber shop, get a candy bar from the soda fountain, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then other than that, they weren't allowed anywhere else, typically. 